So uh, again, we want to welcome all the guys that are joining us this morning. Um, I hope you have your pen and your paper ready because I'm going to tell you everything you could possibly need to know about inspecting a roof. Uh, and if you believe that, I've got some Bitcoins that I'd like to sell you when we get through with the class. So um, let's just have some fun with this class. Um, this is the kind of class that would be probably a lot more fun if we were in person and could have a, a lot of open discussion. Um, so as we go through, as opportunities arise, as I ask some questions on occasion, please join in. Send some, uh, send some notes in your chat box to, to Paul, uh, and we will, we will stop and, and read some of them and have some conversations based on those things. Um, I wanted you to notice on, on the screen, you'll see the PowerPoint that I'm going to be following. Um, this is inspection of roof covering materials, but the, the true point of this entire two hours is to get you to think about, does your protocol for inspecting roofs actually satisfy the TREC standards of practice requirements? Uh, I don't know if we have some guys here that aren't from Texas. Um, I heard we may have some. We've got our InterNACHI brothers that have joined us. Uh, and even if you don't have to follow the TREC standard, the Texas Real Estate Commission sets for us, um, InterNACHI has a fantastic set of standards of practice, and they're, they're quite similar in many ways. So let's talk about the actual protocol and, and following our, our standards of practice. Uh, and I wanted to give just a brief introduction and get our mindset on the standard the standard, as far as discussion for the roof, um, ha has a lot of areas that, that we can uh, give some an opinion on. I mean, um, there has been points where they, they can be argued. Um, so before we get to those points, let's look at how the standard reads uh, and, and what it says about our inspections. So if you look at the, the beginning of the standards, just in the general section, it talks about the standards of a practice apply when a professional inspector or real estate inspector who is licensed under this chapter accepts employment to perform a real estate inspection for a prospective buyer or seller of real property. Um, today, let's just not play the games of, well, I can look at a roof and do an inspection for a roof if that's all they want me to look at. And uh, let, let's look at the standard as a whole uh, and consider this to be something that this is what we are as, as Texas inspectors are going to be expected to follow. It also talks about for purposes of the standards, it's a limited visual survey and basic performance evaluation of the systems and components of the building. If you skip down, B talks about it is not intended to be a comprehensive investigation or exploratory probe, and it's not to determine the cause or effect of the deficiencies noted by the inspector. Uh, I can remember as long as I've been an inspector in the state of Texas, Tapria has always taken the stand of observe and report. And so I'm gonna constantly be reminding you of that. Uh, and so let's talk about what we do have to do uh, and realize that we can go above and beyond that, but let's make sure we're getting the basics taken care of. Uh, it does not require the use of specialized equipment, including but not limited to, and then I've just picked a few of them that really uh, have an, an, an effect on our roof inspections. For instance, ladders capable of reaching surfaces over one story above ground surface. So we're not required to use special equipment, which means a ladder more than, uh, what, 20 feet? I mean, uh, you know, I guess if you were brave enough, you could get a, an eight foot that you could jump up on a roof for, but let's stay realistic here and bring up some of these points. Um, it also talks about um, you're not required to use any method employing destructive testing that damages or otherwise sound materials or finishes. So let's don't take our, our putty knives and our screwdrivers and pry up 
some of the shingle tabs to make sure that they've been nailed correctly. The standards of practice do not prohibit an inspector from providing a higher level of inspection performance other than required by these standards of practice or from inspecting components and systems in addition to those listed under the standard. So we're not saying you can't do better than the basic, but today we wanna make sure that we're meeting our protocols as far as what the standard does expect us to, to do and say. So here's some general uh, limitations. Again, we're still talking about some general entire inspection type limitations. I have picked out a few specifically uh, as far as how it affects the roof. Um, the inspector is not required to inspect lightning arrestor systems. We're not required to inspect solar panels. Um, we're not required to report the cause or source of a condition. We're not required to, um, in, sorry, we're not inspected, it, and say inspected and expected real quick. Uh, we don't have to say the cause or effect of the deficiencies. Uh, any of the issue, following issues concerning a system or component. So in other words, as we look at roofs, we don't have to say a life expectancy or age. Not saying you can't just saying we don't have to. Um, we don't have to be, talk about compliances with codes or listings or testing or protocol authorities. We don't have to discuss manufacturer or regulatory requirements, except explicit, uh, specifically required by these standards. Again, we're not saying you can't or won't. I'm saying this is what Trek is saying we need to make sure that we do and don't have to do. This is an important statement. So if we're going to depart from what Trek is asking us to do, Trek has been very clear on what they expect from us. An inspector may depart from the inspection of a component or system required by the standards of practice only if, first of all, you can do it if the client agrees that the item doesn't have to be inspected. The inspector is not qualified to inspect the item. God forbid, let's, let's skip that one for now. I hope that's not gonna ever be the case. Here's C, in the reasonable judgment of the inspector, the inspector determines that conditions exist that prevent inspection of an item, conditions or material, materials are hazardous to the health or safety of the inspector. So, Think in terms of what are some ideas or what are reasons that we might have conditions that prevent inspection of an item. Um, we're looking at weather. Uh, we're looking at wet roofs, rain. Some of you guys live where it snows. We, we, we don't have that issue very often here in Texas. Um, what are maybe some other conditions? Uh, ever been on a roof that's 110 degrees because it's middle of summer? There just may be several different reasons why in our judgment, we determined that the conditions exist that prevent us from inspecting. And we'll, we'll, we'll show some more examples of these in just a minute. Departure from the standards. This is real important guys. If the inspector does depart from the standards, the inspector must notify the client at the earliest practical opportunity. You know, in the, in the, the very first time I saw this, in fact, I may have even heard a speaker or somebody talk about, if you don't, if you don't get on and walk roofs, then you need to tell them when, when they, in that first phone call. And that very first time you contact that person or that con person contacts you, you need to make sure that you tell them, oh, by the way, I don't walk roofs. Okay. Um, I can tell you in all and complete honesty, in my mind, as I go out to an inspection, I have every intentions of walking every roof. 
So there's no reason in the world why in that first phone call, I would tell that client, oh, by the way, I'm not walking your roof today. Because I'm not going to know that for a fact till I get there. So earliest practical opportunity. Um, here's another, I don't know that you want to call it an argument, but uh, another reason why it's really handy and good if you can have your client present during the inspection. Um, you know, it might be something that we need to discuss right off the bat. Uh, and with them being there with you, hopefully it will be clear to them, oh, well, yeah, I see what you're talking about. We're not going to be able to walk this roof. Um, the inspector does not depart from the standard. The inspector must note the departure on the report and state the reason for the departure. I'm going to give you a real simple example here in just a minute. Um, that literally, I, I think I took straight from one of my inspections, uh, where we can meet all of these expectations in, in a real simple format. Oh, Paul, by the way, make sure you interrupt me if we get some guys coming in with questions or, or comments. Okay, the only comment I've got so far is that wind is another reason Texas wind is horrible sometimes, and you may not want to climb a roof if it's real windy. Yeah, man. Have you been up on one of those roofs and the wind's about to knock you over? That's a scary situation. And even if you're up there, are you going to walk the edge of the roof? There's going to be areas on that roof where you may not want to walk because of that wind. That's a really good example. Here's the departure from standard. This this is section C of this of our, our track report, roof covering materials. Uh, and again, we're going to talk about some of this stuff over and over again. But it, you know, it tells us we have to tell what kind of roof covering we, from where we viewed the roof. Uh, and this is a place where you would tell if you deviate or depart from what the standard says we have to do. So my comment says types of roof covering, asphalt composition shingle. Here, here's a whole topic that we can discuss if you would like to. Uh, we know there are all kinds of materials used for roofs. And then you take each individual example of those types of roofs and realize there are multiple types of that roof covering. Um, consider tile roofs. Some are clay, some are slate. Now they've got some that are that are uh, not composition, but they're they're I can't just I lost the word, but you, you know they're they're not the true slate, but they look just like it. Um, same thing even with the asphalt composition shingle. They're I even still see them every once in a while. It's almost embarrassing to have to tell the client that's a that's a three tab roof. Um, four tab roof, manufactured roof, engineered roof. Um, if you want to put all of that into your types of roof covering, knock yourself out. Go for it. Um, but we need to at least give it a, a general type of roof covering. Yeah, Don, someone's saying, can we just use a drone instead of walking the roof? Well, that's definitely going to be something that we're going to talk about. No question about it. Uh, in fact, that comes up in this next session as far as viewed from. Well, Trek says that we're to, we're to view a roof from, from the roof level. Uh, uh, we'll pull that slide up here in just a minute so I don't misquote it. Um, viewed from roof level and then tell how you viewed it with the use of a ladder uh, as well as from the ground with a camera and extension pole. Um, if you used a drone, you might say, you know, with the use of a drone um, from all sides, from two sides, you know, you get the zero property lines. You may not be able to do all four sides. Um, and then if you, if you deviate or you decide to not walk the roof, you tell them why. I didn't walk the roof because in this inspector's reasonable judgment, the steep slope of the roof would not have allowed me to safely stay on the roof. There you go. You know, 12 12 pitch. I'm not walking that roof. And the older I get, sadly enough, the, the less that steep roof has to be for me to decide I, I don't feel safe on it anymore. 
You know, Don, I, I learned a long time ago, I don't bounce as well as I used to. Man, isn't that the truth? Even if you catch it before the bounce, just from standing the butt on the roof is different as you got older. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Very true, Don. I had an inspector text me the other day that he was on the roof and <clears throat> turn around, get back off the roof, and his ladder was gone. He looks down the road and some guy's got his ladder running down the road with it. Man, that's when you wish you had that carrier permit. <laughs> Remember back when we first started reading this, uh, it talked about you didn't have to have any specialty equipment. Okay, I'm doing a three-story townhome. I, I, I'm sorry, guys, but I don't carry a, a ladder that reaches three stories. I'm going to still put this in the report. You know, also, I did not have access to the second story roof with my 20 foot ladder. Yeah, and a lot of it, you just can't see no matter which angle you get at the thing. Yeah. So, you know, and someone posted new construction says they can't walk the roof due to builder safety protocol in OSHA. Yeah. I'm going to bring OSHA up here in just a minute, just for the fun of it. Uh, someone says, should the soffit and the fascia issues be in the roof covering or on the roof structure? Well, you know, I don't think there's a, a SOP um, police that, that will arrest you if you put it in one place or the other. M my suggestion is just stay consistent. If you cover that as part of the roof, then just consistently put it in that section of the roof. I, I, I put mine in the, you know, in the uh, exterior side walls because um, that covers so, such a large area. Um, but I, do you think it makes a difference, Paul? Well, the biggest thing is you got on that report somewhere. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm like you, the, the cornice and soffits, I usually put under the wall sections. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't guess there'd be a problem with putting it in the roof section. The only thing is, if you look in the in the Texas SOPs, the section's called roof covering materials. Uh, you know, to me, that starts limiting too much about gable ends that you see problems with or I, I i don't know that's just me again i'm not here to judge or tell you you can't i think it's like, it's like the gutters you know now they've clarified the gutters go into the drainage section of the report yeah. and i'd always put it under the roof section because i felt like it was part of the roof yeah yeah but, so i had to change my thinking about that and put it under the gutter sections yeah absolutely so uh you know i think at this point Consistency is probably as as if not more important as far as than where you put it. Um, and then this is a common statement, just the comments, and we're going to talk about comments and things that you can and can't put in there. Um, the roof was a hip designed roof with shingles appearing to be intact and revealing no significant damage as could be seen from my different vantage points. However, at the time of this inspection, the following deficiencies were identified. You know. If you're there with a client uh, and they don't know anything about roofs, that's what they're counting on you to be able to share and teach them about. They look at a roof and they don't see anything wrong with it. You know, that roof looks fine to me. Uh, I don't mind saying that it, 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 it seems to be intact and revealing no significant damage. I don't have huge checks and sections of uh, tabs missing or a huge hole in the roof. So, yeah, it, it may not be revealing any kind of significant damage. However, when we start inspecting these roofs and start picking them apart, there's still going to be times where we have plenty of things and deficiencies that we can list as identified. And this is just a simple, simple inspection uh, example to, to go in the report. Um, obviously, the more complex the roof is, uh, the more you may have that you need to put into this area. Um, but I'm trying to make sure that we hit minimums and, and you know, what Trek is expecting at least to, to see from us. Let's talk about our vantage points. You know, I, for as long as I can remember, this has been a conversation. I don't want to say argument, but we certainly have over the years had many inspectors that kind of disagreed about this, this whole idea. Uh, this is something that I've thrown in here. Again, 
I've been doing this for 15 years and uh, Tapria has been my teacher uh, and in Tapria inspectors have been who I have uh, learned from and listened to. Um, I don't feel like I have to reinvent the wheel when I have such good inspectors that I can ask questions to and they're willing to share. I'm sure InterNACHI has the same feeling and the same type experience that they can draw from. Um, and I, I think, <laughs> I don't know if Jim Heim is with us today. I, you know, I, Jim Heim is somebody that I don't ever stutter to ask questions to. And he's taught me for years and years if everything that you look at and then report on, you ought, you ought to, in your mind, mentally think in terms of, if I'm sitting in front of a judge asking me questions, is this what I should be putting down? Is this the verbiage that I should be using? Uh, and so while not required, it, it might be wise if you document in the, in the report what you might have missed if you deviated from you know from the requirements I, I didn't walk the roof uh, and especially on a two-story roof that might have prevented me from seeing exposed nails um, improper flashing you know, anything that pops in your mind you know right now as we're listening it wouldn't be a bad idea to put that in the report because we all know these clients have expectations that are above and beyond our ability. Um, and it never hurts to document in the report so that if they ever come back at you, you didn't say anything about that nail that was exposed. Now we got water dripping in our attic. Well, you're right, because I, I didn't see it. But, you know, I did mention the fact that I couldn't get on that third story roof and, and I'm, there might have been some things I missed. I also put in my report, you know, these kind of type of conditions. Why we couldn't. Yeah. Uh, it's still due diligence. I mean, don't, don't take anything away from the fact that if you know that there might have been an area or there might have been something that I said I could have missed, maybe we need to bring in a roofing company that's willing to, you know, have that special equipment and get up there and look at something. Um, so while not required, it's not a bad idea. Don't give the impression that the entire roof was inspected if some parts of it were not accessible. Because, you know, that every time that happens, that's the one client all year long, the one client that then comes back because you're mad about something. You know, they just had the wrong impression as far as what you were doing for them. So what does our standard cover uh, specifically about inspections of the roof? And this number one is one of the things that brings up a lot of fun, let's say fun discussion. Let, let's don't talk about getting people upset at each other. The inspector shall, and we know what shall means. The inspector shall inspect the roof covering materials from the surface of the roof. It does not say that he will walk the roof, okay? It says he must inspect the roof covering materials from the surface of the roof. So now there's the discussion. What's the surface of the roof? Do I have to walk it to be at the surface? Can I just touch it and consider myself at the surface? Um, if I'm flying my drone, I get my drone right on top of that roof. If I'm within 12 inches, I'm probably seeing the roof better than when I walk it. I don't know that I'm seeing every inch of it to that point. Uh, you know, what about those roofs that I can't get to? Um, I, obviously, I can't get to the surface of the roof, but I've got a fantastic monocular that I can look through. And man, it looks like if I reached out with my hand, I could touch it. Um, I've got a fantastic camera that's got a, like a 50 time zoom. What is, what is from the surface? And, and that's always the big question. Were the report type of roof coverings? We've already kind of talked about that a little bit. If you want to go into detail and you're brilliant enough to be able to just look at a roof and tell me exactly what that material is, 
God bless you, brother. You know, um, I would rather just stay safe and say it was metal or it was tile or it was composition shingle or it was, you know, um, I, I don't have to be uh, the walking encyclopedia. And I know there's a lot of, lot of inspectors out there that really do know, recognize, and understand these, these roofing materials. I, I just haven't been one of those inspectors. Um, Paul, what about you? Are you that specific? No, I'm certainly not. There's a lot of them that can be confusing. I've seen them with the aluminum type roofs that look like a slate roof or a tile roof install. Some of it you really can't tell. I mean, the tile roof could be clay tile. It could be cement. I mean, there's so many different descriptions that it could be. And, you know, if it's a, just a tile-like roof, right. you know, the metal roof, it's a metal roof. You don't care if it's standing seams or, uh, or what, it's just a metal roof. Right. You know, and, and a lot of the roofs don't have several different materials used. Today, mm -hmm. we're seeing, you know, the composition roofs plus a metal roof installed. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, our biggest job as inspectors is just to uh, go ahead and just identify what we see on the thing. Right, right. I agree completely. Again, this isn't a this isn't a, a roof company inspection that is fixing to put in a bid on repairs and, and they need to be able to tell you what they're fixing to have to match or what's going to have to be replaced or equivalent to. We're there to tell them the condition of the roof. And um, they ask us to put the type of roof coverings. Um, composition shingle should be plenty. Metal roof should be plenty. You know, um, there's if you want to put more, you're welcome to do that. But you, someone's asking, Don, do you have you suspect hail damage? Are you reported as hail damage or suspected hail damage? That's a good question. Let, let's go a little bit further because we are going to talk about hail damage. Um, but that brings up. Let's remember that question because that does bring up a couple of points about what we should or shouldn't talk about when when we look at hail. And, you know, Don, another thing that I do, and if I pull into a neighborhood, if I'm going to inspect a property, I look at the other houses surrounding it, at their roofs. Are they all new? This one's not new? Me you too. Know, I love it when the homeowner's there, because I can ask them, how old is your roof? Me Have too. you ever had roof leaks? you ever had any repairs? Yeah, yeah. And, of course, I'll put that in my report. Homeowner reported this. Yeah, me too. And you know, when the homeowner's there, I don't, I don't know if they're always asked to leave or if the realtor has dropped the ball and nobody has said anything or they were asked and they just refuse. I don't know what the situation is. And quite honestly, I, I, I don't care. But if he's going to be there when I'm there, man, I don't hesitate to start asking questions. Yeah, I don't either. The ones that, ones that I don't like, Don, is those that says, now I'm going to follow you around throughout yeah. the inspection. I just yeah, tell them, hey, to I'm, yeah, I, I'm, they're going to have to find another inspector because I'm, yeah. I'm not going to allow you to follow me around. I'm not yeah. here to teach you, and you're not my client. So either you yeah. leave or I leave. Well, and, you know, I, I mean, I have found there's a you can be very polite and tell them all of that. You know, hey, I can understand what you're doing, but you need to just trust that this is a process. Uh, I'm here on the behalf of our client. Uh, and I'm not going to tell or share or discuss anything that I'm looking at with you. So there's really no reason for you to follow me. Um, I can't, I don't know that I can stop you from following me, but I said, if you're going to follow me, I'm going to, you know, start looking at something different. I, you're going to have trouble keeping up with me. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you don't run into those very often, um, as, especially, well, that's not true. There's been plenty of times where, you know, you got the good old boy who has fixed everything that anybody's ever told him was wrong. And uh, every time you take a picture, he's like, hey, hey, uh, I've already, I fixed that. I, I did. Yeah. Look, brother, I take between two and 300 pictures every inspection. Me shooting a picture, you're going to get really tired if you're going to question every time I aim that camera. So that's, that's true. But that, that asking them questions specifically about the roof is very handy. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always glad to get that opportunity. So uh, report vantage point from where the roof was inspected. 
Um, again, we're going to talk about these here in just a second. I, I gave you a quick little examples of what it might look like if you were um, what vantage points you're using. Um, sometimes you got pictures. I have pictures uh, where I, I feel confident in saying you don't know if I'm standing there and my foot's just outside of that picture or if that's my drone. So I, in my mind that, you know, I feel like I've accomplished with that drone um, what I need to as far as covering the surface of the roof. Uh, I thought I had it here and for some reason I'm, I moved it. Um, I, I, I like using the top left picture where that air conditioner is on the top of that townhome. Um, I, this is a drone picture and I, I, I mean, I've got a really nice drone. I can fly in and get close enough so that I actually can shoot pictures of the grill. I can shoot pictures of the data plate uh, and you would swear you're standing right there by it. So uh, there's definitely some argument for, for using the drones. John, have you ever lost the drone? I have not lost it. Uh, I have crashed it. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, it's funny. We talked about high winds being a reason to not walk a roof. Um, high winds are a good reason to not use a drone. So when you're stubborn enough to take it up, even when it's very windy, you, you know, you, you're taking the chance of damaging it. And sure enough, that's what I did. So, uh, you, in your mind with the drone, you keep thinking, well, I'm just going to be up for, you know, a minute and I can bring it back down and move to another area. And I, it, it never works that way. So when I, you know, years ago, when the drones first started kind of coming out, I had a drone and the drones have gotten so much better now. But back in the day when we first started, you actually had to control the, the drone even as it hovered. Um, and there were there were two times where I actually had to get on a roof that was so steep I asked, I had no business being on that roof and I had to get on that stupid roof to get my drone so for, for a while there, I, quit, I quit using them because I thought okay this is ridiculous I wouldn't have gotten on this roof if I didn't have this stupid drone that got stuck up on the roof for some reason so well uh, speaking of drone someone's asked what kind of drone do you use I happen to use the Mavic Mini. Uh, I, I, I'm amazed at how smooth and how well. I, I was worried about because of it being small that the wind would blow it all over, and it doesn't. I mean, it's just amazing. It's a neat little, neat little drone. Um, I, I use it because it lets me squeeze into some pretty small little areas. You know, some of those valleys down between the the dormers and stuff sometimes it's a little tricky to get up in there with a little bit bigger drone i think uh and and my little my little mini can get just amazing how probably better than if i was up there you know trying to squeeze my big butt down in there where i can't see something <laughs> so uh yeah we'll talk let's talk about some drones again in a minute but um remember we're looking at you need to report it However you did it, you need to report it and tell it what it was, uh, your vantage point was. So, you know, the guy in the middle down here in the bottom, he's on a ladder. He's at the roof surface, right? So um, you get all of these different concepts of the drone actually walking the roof. Um, whichever way you decide to go, you just need to make sure you report it. So just for the fun of it, uh, I, I thought I would throw in just the little concept of, okay, so what does OSHA actually say? Uh, obviously, we're not regulated by OSHA. Um, OSHA has enough trouble regulating companies and, you know, people who are under them. They, they would never be able to keep up with inspectors, inspections and inspectors. So this is really more of a FYI. And quite honestly, OSHA, the whole concept of safety falls on our own shoulders. And maybe we should kind of know. So what does OSHA say about safety? So there's a lot of wording here. Uh, I just thought I would kind of throw it in here at you. Uh, to let you know what how it started, where what 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 it says, uh, some general concepts. Um, 
but when it took, I went to the section about ladders and falls, it, it was pretty, pretty eye-opening. Falls are the leading cause of death in construction industry, accounting for over 3,500 fatalities between 2003 and 2013. Falls from roofs accounted for nearly 1,200 or 34% of the fall deaths during that period. Roofers encounter many hazards on the job, including hazardous associated with work, uh, working at heights and from ladders and power tools and electricity and noise and hazardous substances, uh, extreme temperatures, several of those which directly relate to inspectors. Um, and unless these hazards are controlled by the employer, that's kind of a key word there, uh, roofers risk serious injury, illness, and death. To protect workers on roofing jobs, employers must identify the hazards present and take steps to address them. Uh, and the guide that I was looking at talks about, uh, actually covers the safe practices that prevent falls and, and other type uh, um, injuries. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't have an answer. I, I am an a independent owned inspector, single firm, and I'm not a multi-firm inspection company. Uh, so I, I only answer to God, my wife, and myself uh, when, it comes, when it comes to safety. Um, but I was curious, uh, and maybe somebody can throw out a few ideas and comments. If, if you happen to be a multi-inspector firm, where, where does this fall? For you, are are you the employer? Um, is it does are you responsible for making sure that your inspector is is being safe and following safe work habits? And because I, I don't know the answer to it, do you, Paul? No, that's an excellent question, Don. I, you had my mind rattling there as you began to ask that. You know, it's OSHA doesn't regulate us as ind independent inspectors, but as a a group or a firm that has multi-inspectors, they may actually fall underneath this thing. They and might. That, would, that would change the whole ball game for them if that's the case. I'm seriously. Uh, and you know, and I got, as I was thinking about it, the, the statement I made is true. I mean, OSHA has trouble keeping up with the big companies and the big jobs and then the bigger builders and the, you know, it, it, there's a lot of it out there. It would be tough to regulate and keep up with it. And then you start slipping in these smaller firms, uh, even if you're thinking in terms of the roof companies that put roofs on, there, how, there's a dime a dozen, you know, out there. Uh, there. It would just be a chance of an OSHA guy driving by and seeing them doing something really stupid uh, to even ever be considered caught. But my mind shifted to, on the legal side of it, you know, what if you're a multi-level, multi-inspector firm and you had a guy fall off the roof? Mm. At what point are you liable just because you own the company? And, you know, he was up there doing something he shouldn't have been doing. I don't know. I mean, I don't have the answers to it, but it certainly made me think about it while I was putting this together. Yeah, absolutely, Don. Good point. And those of you, if, if there's any of you online that do have multi-inspectors working for you, this might be something you consider. Yeah, yeah, OSHA doesn't, is not going to come after the in, independent inspector, but, you right. know, if something happens, if you fall off a roof on a job site, on new construction, then, you know, it may totally change. You know, you go to the hospital and everything kicks in with OSHA. What right. were you doing on that roof? Right. So, I mean, there's a lot, lot, of, lot, of, lot of thought that can go in on this one. Yeah, you know, right. we have a lot of liability. Don, you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree more with you as, in, as independent single man operations, or even if you got two or three guys, if you're the lead guy and you fall off a roof and hurt yourself uh, or kill yourself, then, you know, that business is gone. Yeah. So, you know, as you guys, guys climb on these roofs, you've got to be extra careful because roofs are very dangerous. I mean, I grew up in construction. I put on roofs all a bunch of my lifetime and I have fallen off of them. I've ridden ladders down the, down the side as they fall back or <laughs> slip to the side and, yeah, I fell through roofs and everything else. So it was wonder I survived. Yeah. But, you know, as I taught these classes uh, for years to inspectors coming into this business, I would tell them, unless you're a good surfer, 
and you can fly, you might want to be careful. Maybe you start climbing on roofs. <laughs> you know, the one, one I stepped through was a flat roof one time, brand new tar, built up tar and gravel roof. And uh, as I it had like a five foot overhang on the eaves, as I walked that roof, I climbed up because the air conditioner is up on top. And uh, I checked the roof out and all it looked, the roof looked fine. But on my way back, lo and behold, I found a rotted piece apparently and I stepped right through it. One arm and shoulder was hanging on one of the rafters and one on the other and my feet were dangling because I was on the overhang of the roof. And uh, I'll never forget it. The mm -hmm. realtor come out, it made such a loud noise. The, the listing agent come running out the back door of the house, looked up at me and said, I hope to God you've got insurance. Oh my gosh. And I said, you know, before I could even catch myself, I mean, here I am dang dangling, wonder how the crap I'm gonna get out of this thing. And she said to come out to like it. I said, you know what? I hope your homeowners have insurance oh, yeah. because no one disclosed the roof was covered over rotted materials. Yeah, back at you for sure. So I never heard any more out of them on it, but of course I wrote that roof up that need to be totally replaced. It just <laughs> aggravated me enough. I, I didn't cut them any slack on that one. <laughs> but yeah, the point of that is, guys, when you walk on a roof, you really don't know what you're walking on. Yeah. I mean, I've had I've had investors put new shingles over rotted plywood. And do you think they're gonna tell you that? No. You'll yeah. see it and if you step through it or from the inside the attic. But as you get up and walk on those roofs, for crying out loud, please be safe because we, we kind of have a shortage of inspectors as it is. We don't want to lose any more of you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, if we got any guys here today that are multi, you know, multi inspector firms, we'd love to hear from you what you what you know, and what you don't know, or, you know, how you're covered. Because it, it, it's a curiosity subject. It's just an interesting subject. We're not going to judge one way or the other. We just would love to hear from you if you have have that situation. Yeah, and you mentioned Jim Heim a while ago. He's popped in on the chat line here and says the law will determine if you are an employer, and that would be a claim. There's no defense against personal injury in Texas. Ah, there you go. Yeah, um, yeah multi-inspector firms is the inspector working for you, uh, for your company as an employer of workers on roof jobs. Are you identifying the hazard present and taking steps to address them? I'm just asking, uh, just a good, a good thought, a good, you know, a good question. Um, this is, we're still looking at, um, th this slide is still looking at um, um, the OSHA concept. Um, I, I, I don't want to read through this. It's not that interesting. Uh, I'm going to leave it up here for a minute. And if you can, if you can see it clear enough, uh, hopefully you can, see it for yourself, but you realize how my point wanted to be to show you just how specific OSHA gets, uh, you know, starting at the beginning from the, the roof slope. Um, so different slopes call, change the rules and, and uh, uh, considerations and what you can or can't do. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting how often it talks about uh, the, the employer has to provide, I think that's a, a key phrase, um, has to provide protection from falling by guardrails or safety nets or personal fall arrest systems, which is what uh, I learned how to use in that class that we were talking about at the very beginning. Um, the class, that class was actually set up for, to teach adjusters uh, how, to, how to walk roofs because obviously back then they weren't, when I took this class, you weren't using drones. And so every ingester had to walk the roof. They didn't have satellite, satellite pictures or all the cool stuff that they have now. So um, adjusters had to know how to walk on that roof. And we had, I called it my mountain climbing equipment because that, that's pretty much how it worked. Uh, so I, I know we got a lot of inspectors out there who aren't afraid of heights and who are very comfortable at heights and walking roofs really do not bother them. Um, and I don't know, but what they're more dangerous than the guy that is smart enough to be scared of it. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. Good point, uh, Don. And that's, that's one thing as inspectors we have at, 
that, that, that sense about us that we want to know more, we want to see more, we want to be able to explain more. And usually that gets us in trouble. You know, that's why the state has a standards practice for us. But whenever we stretch out, reach out beyond that, then that's where inspectors get in trouble on it. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about the insurance. Uh, someone posted here, the insurance companies do not let their adjusters climb anything over five and 12, one story. Well, that's that depends. They do have a, a steep roof class and training they take where they can go up more than that. But, uh, you know, talking about the insurance company, I had a realtor meet me this week uh, doing an inspection. She says, well, she said, my roofer says that the roof is fine. It's probably got about four more years of life left on it. I said, well, did he come out and look at it? She said, no, he looked at it on satellite. <laughs> I said, oh, so I mean, he really zoomed in big time on it. I said, you got that report? Of course, she didn't have it to share with me. But <laughs> so, you know, these, these realtors, you know, if they can get someone just tell me it looks okay, and I actually called the roof for total replacement because of the condition of it. But she said, my roofer said it would last about four more years. I said, well, your roofer really didn't come out and look at it. So, I mean, you know, sometimes these stories come out and that you, you may not want to put a lot of value to, to the results of some of these satellite views, even though they're, they're good, but they show the layout of the roof. Right. They can measure how many squares of roofing it takes to replace it all. But sometimes it's not, not for the best. Right. I've been told, made comments like that before, too, and I, I always just kind of quietly smile and say, man, he's good. I, I usually have to walk away to be able to tell you how old it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I never tell them, and they always want to know, how long is this roof going to last? I don't know how long you and I are going to last. Yeah, yeah, uh, That I think we, we bring that up here in just a few minutes, but yeah, they without fail, they ask that. How long do you think that roof will last? Well, short of a hurricane, I've seen them 50 years old. I'm not saying it would be good at 50 years old, but, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know. It, it might blow off tomorrow, so I don't give that answer. Well, one of the things, Doc, anyone can be a roofer. I mean, our building contractor, they're not licensed in Texas, so yeah, anyone can do it. Anyone. Anyone. I love down at the bottom, I meant to bring this up, where it talks about steep roofs. Each employee on a steep roof with unprotected sides and edges six feet or more above the lower levels shall be protected. <laughs> six feet means you could you can reach up and touch it. That's not that's not much of a distance. And they're saying that's enough to fall would hurt you. And it's that kind of stuff that that we just kind of especially the guys that aren't afraid of heights. You know, they just are so comfortable up there. Um, one of my favorite inspector friends is uh, Linda McCracken. I don't know if she joined us or not. She usually works on Saturdays with her son. But, uh, you know, she she swears she walks every roof. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm not going to question her, but she walks every roof. She's, Paul, she's our age. So I, I, every time that subject comes up, I keep telling her, Linda, you got to quit doing that, girl. Yeah, Linda, you need to stop doing that, girl. Man, <laughs> we love you and want you to be around. And God, dog, that, that's just crazy. It's just crazy. Uh, I, I, I didn't think I, I could discuss the inspecting of the roof and not at least just talk about ladder safety. Um, I don't have any statistics, but it's probably scarily amazing how many falls happen when we're not on the roof, but are actually on the ladder. Um, especially that first step off onto the roof and that first step back on that to me, that's the scariest step of the whole day of getting back on that ladder. Um, but there's some actual do's and don'ts, you know, there's some actual logic, um, very specific that, that comes up with ladder safety that that four and one rule uh, is a very consistent way if you can ever get that into your head of what that looks like you know for every whether you're using feet or meters or whatever you use as a measuring tool in your own mind for every uh, four feet up the ladder needs to be one foot away from from the wall that you've got the ladder leaning on um, a, another kind of sensible way to figure that out if you've got your toes touching where the ladder hits the ground, your arms, when you reach out to the ladder, should be fully extended. 
Um, if if you're not if if you're not leaning that ladder to that point, you're probably not leaning it to where the ladder safety rule takes uh, effect. Um, and this kind of brings up a question just to throw out here at the guys that are listening to the class. Uh, you know, one thing that we we really should be, I hope everyone that's inspecting and getting their ladder up on, on the roofs, keeping in mind is how easy it is to damage these rain gutters. You know, if, if you're leaning a ladder and you're leaning it against rain gutter and you're leaning it to where it meets the ladies, the ladder safety recommendations, I don't know, unless you're just really skinny, since I'm not, I don't know. But, you know, a guy like me, man, I can tear up a, a, a rain gutter quick. Um, so and what do you do then, Don? Do you just put on your reports the gutter is damaged? Well, in the beginning, when that's what was happening, I, yeah, I was actually fessing up. Like, look, man, I, I put my ladder on. on I got to get on. And I would always blame it on Drake. Hey, man, I, I got to get on that roof. And it had a run gutter. I'm, I'm really sorry, you know. Um, I never had to replace one. But I, there was more than once where the homeowner was pissed at me. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't take me long. But... <laughs> I put a picture at the bottom of what I live by now. And that's one of those, uh, uh, oh, I just forgot the name of it. That, that extension that connects to your ladder that holds the ladder off. This is, this is a really neat, really neat uh, uh, safety tool besides taking care of the rain gutters. And you see it there in the bottom right. I, I actually um, found this and learned to use this on that, roof climbing class um that crazy guy they had uh they had a, a roof sitting on the ground to, so that you could learn how to tie to it and do all kind of neat stuff with it and then they had a one story and a two story and then they had a three story roof and so i, I don't well, i don't know how tall that is 30 plus feet up in the air and so they had an extension ladder that could reach that roof uh, and he got at the top of that roof and he at literally, now he had his safety harness on, don't get me wrong, but he literally could stand on that top rung and hold his hands out. I, I used to have a picture of it and I looked everywhere and I couldn't, he literally would stand on that top rungs with his hands out, hold, you know, like he was addressing the crowd uh, and that ladder wouldn't give because of the way these are designed, your weight is actually carried by this this support uh, and you didn't have to worry about the bottom of the the ladder jumping out from underneath you so if you're still climbing roofs and you still you carrying ladders with you this is something that you might consider um getting getting hold of because they're amazing i won't I, I just short of won't get on a roof if i don't have that with me i always have mine with me so yeah you're right don those things do really stabilize that ladder it's amazing what they do plus it gives you a little space from the gutter so if you don't damage the gutter as we was talking about That's hey we're gonna good. be we're gonna take a, a break here in just a couple of minutes uh a five minute break in between all this but i do have one question someone asked that we haven't answered okay so do you use thermal imaging on roof inspections uh, I, I have used them on flat roofs. I mean, that's I don't use them on a, a standard residential roof, sloped roof. I don't, I don't use them on that. You get weird reflections and temperature rating changes. And you, even on flat roofs, you know, you got to keep in mind, you shoot a roof in the morning, you go back and look at it in the afternoon, it looks completely different with the infrared. So mornings are the best time to do a flat roof because that any moisture that's under that roof is still cool enough to you know to show up but correct and someone said that's called a roof stabilizer or ladder stabilizer, stabilizer. And, you know those big words are just hard on me that's all there is to uh, it. I hear you. and somebody <laughs> put a, a link in the uh q a uh that you can do that but you can buy these things at home depot or Lowe's oh yeah yeah you know, box stores and they yeah. just they just attach to your ladder yeah, but until I saw that guy stand on that top rung, I, I really just didn't hadn't given it much thought. It was kind of in my mind a pain in the butt to carry around with me and hook to my ladder. And 
But boy, once I saw him do that, it was like, I'll, I'll never, because that first step, it also shortens your ladder. I know we need to take a break, but uh, just one more reason to limit what how high the roof can be, because when you put that uh, stabilizer on it, you lose like two rungs and it gives you a little handle to grab hold of on your ladder. You know, there's a lot of positives about having the roof. So, okay. So when we, when we uh, last spoke, <laughs> we were still talking about ladder safety. I hope, I hope uh, we gave you some things to think about, um, something to keep in mind. Anytime you can get good ideas and, and things to make you a better inspector, it's always a great idea. Uh, I know I strayed a little bit for a second here from the uh, from the standard, but I just felt like we needed to, as a group to at least discuss some of these concepts um, before we before we completely leave the ladder safety. Um, let's look at the idea that uh, I, I threw some numbers out here just to make again to get our minds thinking in terms of what we uh, might be looking at uh, from the height. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? No, go ahead. Uh, from the height to uh, gutter to the support point, in other words, from the ground to the gutter, uh, if you've got a roof that's nine to 13 feet off the ground, you're looking at needing a 20 foot ladder. If you uh, buy this size ladder, it includes a three foot extension above the roof line. Uh, and if you remember too, at the very beginning, one of the things that I brought up was the fact that um, Trek says that we don't have to have specialty equipment uh, and we don't have to have something that reaches a roof more than a one story roof. So again, you can do more, you can have more, you can provide more. Um, but Trek does, when it comes to roof, Trek does allow us to take care of ourselves and protect ourselves um, and try to help keep us out of trouble when it, when it comes to get into these roofs. Hey, Dom, speaking of getting in trouble on roofs, you know, we get some pretty hot summer days here and someone's asking, what do you do when it's, you know, we've got the triple digit heat uh, walking on an asphalt roof because it will cause damage. Now, yeah. I think all of us have probably seen new construction where they've walked on the bricklayers or someone putting stone up the wall where they have to walk on a roof or are just painters. And yes. you see the roof damage. Many times I've written them up as damaged roofs. Ah, uh, it's damaged. So what what's what do you think would be a good plan on summer? Walk the roofs or not? Well, as an inspector, absolutely not, in my opinion. Uh, because you will damage those shingles in, in, in those high temperatures. There's no question about it. And you, uh I I I even believe that you might damage it and not see it that same day or that immediately, you know, that as that heat continues and it starts, you know, opening up and softening up, I, I, I just don't think there's any hesitation to say you walk a roof at those temperatures, you're going to damage those shingles. That's my opinion anyway. What do you say, Paul? Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. As I was training, uh, inspectors or new, new inspectors in the field, when we had classes where we have 10 at a time, we take them out and they'd walk on a roof and I'd see all 10 of them climb up a ladder at one time or another, walk on the same path on the roof, yep. get back down. I look, I think, good gosh, we just damaged these people's roofs. Yep. Yep. And you know, it's it, the foot traffic does damage the roof. I mean, the granulars do come off and, you know, speaking, speaking of that, Don, uh, on the roof, one thing that a lot of inspectors forget when you have a condenser sitting outside the, the roof, it should be something on the roof to divert the water away so the stuff doesn't drain onto that condenser unit. Uh, a lot of times those granulars on the roof wear off, you know, as you see them in gutters all the time. Yep. The manufacturer, the ACs, don't want that roof drainage to go onto their unit. So yeah. just a thought. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and depending on what kind of time we have toward the end of the class, um, we're going to kind of start going through some specifics like that in areas that these are some things that we should be looking at, um, you know, just to, we're really today talking about what the standard of practice is requiring and wanting from us, but it's kind of hard to not get into a little bit of discussion about, are you looking at, you know, this and this, and then we'll look at some things toward the end of the, of the report. Granular is definitely 
something that we that we'll talk about. So we're still talking about what the standard says that we're required to report. Uh, we are required to report evidence of water penetration. Uh, I, I think these pictures pretty much say it all. Um, it, it, it's not that tricky or difficult to see uh, if there's evidence of water penetration because it's usually something like this where they've tried to address it. You know, it's one thing if we've got water dripping into the roof and nobody knows it yet, or you're the first one to find it, or maybe they knew there was a little something and they, they can't find it. That's one thing. Um, it's another when it's like some of the pictures we're staring at here. Don, uh, are you saying that flex seal doesn't work? <laughs> I saw it on TV. Well, not you know the problem here is that he didn't put enough. But luckily, <laughs> luckily we don't have to you know evaluate the repair, and we'll talk about that in just a minute too. But yeah, if he put more on it, it probably could have stopped that that water leak. But um, yeah, we'll we'll move on here. Uh, the second thing we need to we need to report that we have evidence of previous repairs. So I hope everybody is doing that when they're doing their inspections um, and they're reporting it. You know, it appears to me that there was some repair work done on the, on the roof. Uh, we need to report flashing details, skylights, other roof penetrations. Um, and I, by the way, this is worded immediately. The first thing that popped in my mind was this question. Does your report comment on flashing details or skylights? If there's no deficiencies, and and so should it? What do you think, Paul? I mean, this is kind of vague, don't you think? Yeah, it, it is. But I mean, it's, it's it's wide open, so we can actually give opinions on on what we're seeing there. I yeah. mean, flashing details can vary. I mean, flashing details in the in the building codes is probably one, the one thing that's listed so many times in the codes till it's. Uh, you know, you, you can't even count them all. So, I mean, right. flashing detail, I mean, that encompasses a lot. Wow. Skylights, you know, if it's got the bubble glass across the thing, I don't know that I've ever seen one that didn't leak, you know, because they're older skylights. The newer ones don't have that glass bubble over them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, you know, also they need diverters on the skylights if they meet certain width requirements, just like a chimney does. That's right. That's right. Because they never have that. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, thought I'd throw that question out because I mean, there's there are times when we 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 inspect something and and really aren't calling out specific deficiencies. Uh, you know, um, I was just curious if people still report what type of flashing they saw, um, if if they go into that kind of detail. Uh, let's talk about the concept of reporting previous repair. Um, there is no need to discuss the type of repair, quality of repair, or extent of repair. Just report repairs. You are opening a can, this is opinion, but you are opening a can of worms if you start talking about what they did and how they did. Um, in my opinion, I just think you'd be crazy to start getting into trying to explain what that repair was. Um, you know, not to mention if you weren't there, you don't man, we, you don't know what he did or didn't do. You can see what it looks like, but they're not asking us to do that. So, um, uh, you know, you, you hear inspectors talk about, well, in their report, they, you know, they'll start talking about things. And I, I, I don't, I just catch myself thinking, man, can of worms, brother, can of worms. I can't help it. It's just in my DNA. Uh, reporting evidence of water penetration, there's no distinction between it's leaking now and it's leaked before. Um, neither is there a distinction between degrees of evidence. It was a small stain. It was a large stain. It, you know, a stain is a stain. A leak is a leak. You start getting into that putting um, degrees involved in it. And again, that can of worms, I think you're just digging a hole that's going to get yourself in trouble. And then they're not asking us to do that. Our job is to observe and report. And that's what we should be doing. I saw evidence. 
of water penetration, you know, because of a stain that was in the ceiling of the whatever, or in the roof decking while I was in the attic. You can tell how, when, and where, but distinct distinction between uh, is it a current leak or a past leak? That's you know, that's crazy. We see we see evidence and we need to report it. So if we take a quick review and look at how, and it's funny too, you need to keep in mind the standards of practice actually write some of this stuff twice. They put it in two different sections. Uh, uh, the inspector shall inspect the roof covering materials from the surface of the roof. We talked about that. Um, they need to repi uh, report the type of roof covering, the vantage point where the roof was inspected. Um, they need to report evidence of water penetration, evidence of previous repairs, flashing details, skylights, and other roof penetrations. Um, and we, you know, in, in what we've talked about was just um, some of the real obvious ones, but how many of us, I mean, just constantly write up the, the boot jack flashing over the plumbing vent pipes? You know, there's, like Paul said, there's, there's just so much flashing that's up there that we need to be paying attention to. So, yeah, the other, the other thing about those plumbing vents <clears throat> pipes on the roof, make sure they're not capped. Oh, um, man. A lot of times you'll find them where they're capped. Well, they're definitely not going to vent properly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I found one capped with a Coke can. <laughs> They had actually cut the top. You could barely did it with a knife. They cut the top out of the Coke can and slipped it over the, the roof vent and then taped it so it wouldn't rattle, I guess. I don't know. Uh, somebody didn't like the people who lived in the house, apparently. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the fumes, gases get out of that house. Uh, you know, the, you see weird stuff like that, and you can't help but start wondering, what in the world were they thinking? What solution did in their mind is solved? I don't it, It's funny. The inspector shall report as deficient deficiencies in fasteners, adhesions, roof covering materials, flashing details, skylights, and other roof penetrations. So not only do you report them, you report them the deficiencies in them. Um, fasteners. You know, sometimes when you're in the attic, you can see root, um, nail patterns. Um, but unless a shingle is lifting where you can put your hand on it and actually gently lift it up and it lift, you, you, you're probably not going to see fasteners. Uh, and if you can, it's a deficiency because you, you shouldn't be able to see nails in between those tabs. So, you know, it, it's not that difficult to be, to be list, listing if the fasteners are a problem. Same goes with the adhesion. Um, I know, um, there's a prominent inspector who's been around forever that teaches or used to teach a lot. I'm not going to throw a name out, but it used to blow my mind. He talked about he always had a putty knife with him and he would actually pry some some shingles open so that he could see nail patterns and adhesion. And, and then he carried the little tube of the roof ceiling goop with him and resealed it. But wow. I, I, I always thought that was crazy. Um, and Trek says we don't have to do that. So um, if you find it, you report it. But I certainly wouldn't suggest causing it to, so that you could say you looked. Um, we're going to look at all of these. We're going to look at examples of all of these here in just a minute um, so that we can get some samples and ideas in our head. Uh, I, 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 on Facebook, before when I was putting this together, I threw out anybody that wanted to send me some pictures, be, feel free to do so. And I, I had quite a few pictures sent to me. So uh, I know that we're all seeing just ridiculous stuff out there. So um, it's not hard for us, any of us that are doing inspections to know uh, what we're looking at out there. This is a good topic though. This is going back to above and beyond or minimum what the standard requires. The inspector is not required to inspect the roof 
from the roof level, if in the inspector's reasonable judgment, the inspector cannot safely reach or stay on the roof or significant damage to the roof covering materials may result from walking on the roof. And I, I think we've brought all of these up in, in our discussions up till now. Um, safely reaching or staying, those, you know, those are two reasons right there to not get on a roof uh, over and over and over again. So, uh, Trek has, has protected us in this in this area, I, I would say, if, if, if we want to use our common sense and we just have to document, you know, you, you have to tell what you did. I'm not required to determine the remaining life expectancy of the roof covering or the number of layers of roof covering materials. You know, I, I I know that we're supposed to report if we have uh, multiple layers of roof covering, but we don't have to prime apart and try to figure out exactly how many number of layers there are. You you know, it should be suffice to be able to point with your client there and say, see the normal normal roof covering is not an inch thick. So I, I believe we have I believe we have more layers than what we're supposed to. So um, uh, let me ask a question on this. I'm talking about the layers of roof. What if it was originally a wood shingle roof and then they covered composition? Man, you know, I've gotten myself in trouble before. Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I used to, without fail, called out if I saw a composition roof on top of a, a, a cedar shingle, you know, a, a wood roof. Um, because there was a time when I, I would swear that it, uh, insurance companies weren't covering that. They just flat would say they will not cover. It's still it's still that way, Don. Yeah, if it has a wood shingle roof that's covered with composition, insurance companies don't cover it. I had a home oh, last year or so that I did, uh, and I, I saw the roof. It was kind of uneven, wavy on the outside. Yeah. And I thought ah, something going off this roof. And I told myself, I bet it's wood shingle roof covered over. So as I got in the attic, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, I see yeah. all the wood shakes underneath, you know, the roof. So I told the people, I told the realtor, I said, you know, you guys need to check the insurance carrier and make sure they're going to even insure this house. Right. So before I finished inspecting the attic, the guy come got me and said, you can stop. He said, my insurance company will not cover this house. Right, right. So, that's I mean, right. that's that's a story that I'm hearing from a lot of clients, a lot of insurance companies. So, you know, it's and I think it's basically because it's a big fire hazard. Well, well that's one true. reason. And then the yeah. other one is that when they, the insurance company replaces that, if a hailstorm happens, they have to strip it all off. And yeah. then they have, to re, they have to apply wood decking down. So their cost just became much higher than... Uh, if it was just removing a layer of composition shingles and re-roofing. Yeah, and you mentioned too the fact that that composition shingle roof does not lay down properly. Uh, you know, it, it makes you curious as far as what does that do to the warranty of the materials that are on the roof that, that can't be installed properly. You know, there's a million reasons why a manufacturer is going to say, no, we, we're not going to warrant that roof, you know. So, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like the jay flashing that we use against right. the wall. You know, it's got that little hook on the shingles on one side. And as you put a roof over that, that shingle's not laying flat. And the roof manufacturer says their shingles are too lay flat. That's right. So, but the the International Building Code now allows J flashing or continuous flashing in mm -hmm. place of the step. But the manufacturers, if you read their inst instructions, it's going to say sidewall flashing shall be in the step flashing manner. So, you know, manufacturer specs supersede the codes, but you got to know who whose shingle you're looking at, and exactly what the manufacturer said. So, you know, yeah. it's just you know, there's a lot out there if you start looking at it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Isn't, isn't being an inspector fun? Look at all this stuff. Yeah, uh, and everything that we've just discussed is another argument from my side of the story as to why I like having my client there because we should observe and report. I saw shingles on top of a wood shingle. You need to make sure your insurance company that 
it doesn't manufacture, you know, you can, there's so much to discuss. And if all you're doing is just saying in a report, you know, I observed composition roof laid on top of the cedar shingles. You, I mean, you're just opening up conversations and arguments and the, you're not helping your client. He doesn't know what's going on. And when they're there, we can have this entire conversation face to face and not that that even necessarily gives the true answer as far as, well, what should I do about it? Hey, man, I, these are just the things that you need to be aware of as far as this house, you know? So I know it's easier to do an inspection with the client not there. I mean, I know it is. It's faster, it's easier, it's less likely to be distracted, but man, the phone calls and the problems that you, you are able to uh, take care of on site with the client there. It, Absolutely. To me, it's just day and night. Just day uh, and night. Jim Heim said, if, if a, you pry up a shingle along the coastal counties, you might end up buying a roof. Yeah. You know, a certified by an engineer and popping the seal can break the certification. Yeah, Jim's told me that before too. I know. I, I mean, I, like I said, I'm not going to get in. You know, and in the earlier days, maybe that was uh, something that the early inspectors thought or felt they needed to do. I, I don't know. And obviously, we've gotten better at what we do. Uh, and insurance companies have changed, and and especially in those wind zones, like you get those certifications, uh, you 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 just can't go in and start making changes like that. So yeah, he's absolutely right. Someone asked, do you tell multiple layers from the eave or from the rake? Well, you know, if you're going to do it from the eave, you just want to make sure that you're, you're, you're recognizing the fact that you've got a starter strip. Whether it's a true starter strip or, I mean, every once in a while, you still see the old, the old roofer that says, this is how we've been doing it forever. And you realized all he did was turn them, turn them, spin around the, a normal set of shingles, but uh, I write that up too. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I have certainly seen the layers where you could do it from the, you know, from the E. It was pretty obvious that there were multiple layers. But yeah, several were... more questions, Don. Let me run these by you. Yeah. Uh, somebody commented that decking today costs fifty-five dollars a sheet. I thought, wow, yeah, you start stripping a roof, putting on decking and fix file or sheet, that insurance company, their cost went up if they had to remove the wood shingles, put the decking on it. Yeah, or even worse, uh, they don't cover that entire ex uh, expense, and you, you think your client's not going to be upset at you because you didn't mention it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, someone asked, can you cover a composition roof with metal? You, you hear my answer. <laughs> Good answer, Don. Uh, yeah, you can do it. I mean, is it right? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what the consequences of, of covering a composition with metal. Yeah, if it's got a decking, solid decking underneath, I'd say strip the composition and put your metal on. I think it would last a lot longer and be a better roof for you. I mean, Just you know, opinion. if you can afford a metal roof, what are you saving by put it on top of a composition. You know what I mean? A poor man that needs to save money, he's not putting a metal roof on his roof anyway. So I, I just try to be logical about it. But bottom line is observe and report and not judge and not, I, hey, it looked appeared to me that there was a metal roof that was installed on top of the composition roof. Absolutely. That's all I saw. Yeah. We did. Just report it. <laughs> yeah. If it's there, I mean, don't you don't have to tell me it's right or wrong. Just report it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another one says, I see clay concrete tile roofs with, ins I don't know if it's insulation underneath it instead of the proper underlayment of asphalt felt. Insulation is a form of acoustic insulation used for flooring. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer on that myself, Don. You got an answer? Nope. nope. Yeah, if anybody's got an answer for that one, let us let us know. Type yeah. it in the Q and A or chat box, and we'll we'll share it with people. Yeah, where's Clay in the meeting? Uh, let's see. Is it not allowed to check for the leaks of the flashings or roof covering through the attic? 
Is it not allowed? What? what yeah. is... That's what it says. Is it not allowed? Of course, you can check the side. That's just the second means and method of seeing if the roof had any leaks is from the attic. Yeah, yeah. And and flashing sometimes sometimes you you know from the from the roof, especially, and, and we see it in older homes where you can see clear as day it, it was a j flashing or a continuous type flashing or it was step flashing you know, if nothing else it's just good to see as an inspector back up what you kind of already knew or suspected you know yeah uh, absolutely yeah uh here's, a, here's another good question it says what causes the ripples in composition roofs often seen on newer homes well there's i mean there's more than one answer to that but um I think spacing becomes real important, both on the gapping with the decking and the distance between roof rafters. And another thing is they, they will put the underlayment down uh, if they're using felt paper yeah. and they, they leave it exposed for days at a time when they're not supposed to, they're supposed to cover it immediately. When they do that, if you look up at and see the felt paper underlayment on the roof and it's all wrinkly and wavy mm -hmm. and not sealed flat, then your shingles are probably going to have the same type of effects once they put them on. Yeah. And you so, know, I mean, that's a bunch of, bunch of different reasons. I mean, it could mm -hmm. be the decking buckle, but I mean, if it is, you, you can usually tell if they didn't put the H clips on the yeah. decking and yeah. uh, the decking swole uh, after a time. And then the roof, if you can outline a four by eight area, and you see it repeated, it's probably a decking issue. Yeah. But you know, sometimes they slap that that material down so fast that it's all wrinkled up as they put it on, you know. So you like you say, if it's wrinkled and they put those shingles on top of it, you're probably gonna see it, notice it. Yeah, and and the only way to correct is start all over. Yep. Absolutely. Of course, here here's what the builder's gonna tell them, because I've heard it throughout my 27 plus years is as soon as it gets hot enough, those shingles will lay flat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they'll, they'll look them in the eye and tell them that when it's 100 degrees outside. As soon as it gets hot enough, uh, how hot is hot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we even still hear that from the builder on brand, you know, the brand new homes. They still pull that, that crud. Yeah, it's lifting a little bit, but when it gets hot enough, it'll lay down flat and seal. Okay. Well, you've got a year to hope that that happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Another one, Donna, questions popped up. Said, I occasionally see surface cracks in fiberglass, asphalt, architectural shingles. So I call these out, but I've been told by a roofing contractor that these are not defects. What's your comment? Observe and report. I call is, that your, is that your answer to everything, Don? I'm telling you, if I see it, <laughs> it gets a picture taken and it goes in the report and I don't give any kind of a judgment. Is it right or wrong? I do list it as a deficiency. And my anytime they come back with some weird explanation like that, I my, my comeback is in a perfect world, I would rather not see a crack in my roof material. There you, you go. go. You just say it's not a deficiency great then the client has nothing to worry about but in in my world i mean that's like the corner pops on foundations are they deficiency are they a failure no but i write them as a deficiency because i don't want to see corner pops on my foundation you know i don't want to see cracks in my roof material I, and if it's there and and it shouldn't or normally isn't it's deficient and i'm not going to judge it or argue with you or i'm going to observe it and I'm going to report it. There you go. Yep. Someone asked or said, uh, are those wrinkles cosmetic? I think you kind of answered that in our discussion just before that. Yeah, they're so really. Good. That one. <laughs> cosmetic. The question is cosmetic to whom? Yeah, right. Right, right. Absolutely. So, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it's you're absolutely right. Don makes such a great point. Observe and report because that's what our job is. We don't have to tell them how to fix it. We don't have to tell them all the deficiencies that we see, just right. something was deficient and move on. Sometimes we try to overthink these inspections and we overcomplicate our job. I mean, inspectors, you know, we, it's hard. It's quite honestly, it's hard to have anything on the report not marked as deficient. 
whenever we start reporting everything we see. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes how do you put it in perspective? Well, that's between you and the client. But, you know, the biggest thing is if you see something that's not right or as strange or unusual, write it up. Right. Right. Absolutely. And if the client's there, I can have this discussion and I can explain, look, I'm going to write it as a deficiency. You know, you may have people that argue and say it isn't. And I, and I don't want you freaking out. And this isn't something to, to go to court. I'm just letting you know, look, this is what we're seeing. And, and then you have to decide, are you walking away from this because of what we're looking at? Or, or is it worth more investigation? Or do you need to make some phone calls? But my job with you here with me today is to see what we see. And this is something we see. So, all right, go on, Don. I want to see some of the pictures you got here of issues on roofs. Okay, uh, let's. We're almost there. Um, Cause hail, we talked about hail a little bit, and I threw some definitions in here real quick. Inspector is not required to identify latent hail damage. Okay, so what does the word latent mean? Uh, it has a bunch of meanings. Um, so I literally. In my mind, this statement was describing hail damage. And so I, being married to an English teacher, then I, that meant that the word latent was being used as an adjective. And as an adjective, it means apparent or obvious. So we don't have to go up with our magnifying glass and crawl around on our hands and knees and be able to identify hail damage if it's latent and any moron can see it's hail damage, we, we don't have to identify latent. It, it, how many times have you heard people say, if you're on a roof in Texas, it's got hail damage. You know, you know what I mean? Um, now, obviously there are, and I think I've got some pictures where it, sometimes it's difficult to show the difference between hail damage and some of the other things that, that we'll look at, granted. but the term latent, you know, obviously this roof has, a, and whether it's a whole lot or just a little, or you've got to be looking for it, if it's obvious hail damage, we, we don't, we're not required to put that in the report. Um, I, I, it, back to my client always hears it, hey, you had hail damage, but I'm sure everybody in this neighborhood has the same, you know, it's not the kind of hail damage that destroyed your roof and now has to be replaced, I, I, I don't think. Um, you might, you might check to, to make sure, but you know, Trek says, I don't have to list this. And so I'm not going to list this. And again, Don, it's the same way. Look at the other houses around them. Yep. If everybody's getting new roofs and yours not, you might ought to double check that roof. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and that with the next one down exhaustively examine all fasteners and adhesions. If we look at the word exhaustively, in my mind, I picture somebody crawling around on their hands and knees. I see, I see a roof adjuster coming up with his piece of chalk and circling, you know, everything that he can find to justify replacing a roof. In my mind, that's what I see when we say exhaustively. Um, comprehensive, in-depth, thorough. I hate using the word thorough because I like to consider myself to be a thorough inspector. Uh, but exhaustively kind of sends it to that next level. Uh, pride, uh, provide an exhaustive list of locations of deficiencies. Um, you know, you get some of these roofs that are in bad shape. Wow. You, you start listing every single one and take a picture of it. Your even 40 page report becomes an 80 page report. And at some point you're like, okay, I get it. We, <laughs> We have some deficiencies, uh, and, and so uh, the standard says, you know, you, you don't have to, in the, in a weird way, it, it feels like if you're listing every single detailed one that you list, all of a sudden you miss one, and now they're mad at you again, you know. Well, you listed 67 of them, but I didn't see you put this one down. 
Yeah, that actually gives it gives us some protection the way right. the right. standards are. So I, uh, guess I have to replace the roof because I forgot to mention this one nail after 50 others where we have pictures of it. Really? Don, the question was asked on a shingle overhang. Uh, if it overhangs the you know the ease the edge of the roof an inch, is that too much? Uh, that's a good question. And actually we got pictures of that. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's a that's some, one of the examples that I'll throw in here in just a minute. And I don't remember how many slides away from that I am, but I'm pretty close. Um, oh, here we go. I thought I was close. Um, so I threw out some examples of repairs. Um, Cause I've, I've been asked that before. Do you, do you write up a single tab? Yeah. <laughs> a single tab is a repair. And someone asked, would you, do you chalk it? Do you mark the roof whenever you're on? I, I, I don't anymore. I did years ago. I don't know if my weight or my age finally said this is stupid, but um, I take pictures. I use like quarters or my keys next to it so that we can get some sort of idea on size, you know, um, but no, I quit marking it. So when you see deterioration on a roof, do you, do you mark it as minor, moderate, or significant? I nope, I don't. Do you? No, I don't. If it's if it has any type of damage, it's damage. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Here's a picture of the. I, I'm sure um, this is pretty rare. I don't imagine all all inspectors get to see this, but you know, is a repair multi tabs. You think? I love these. I'm, I've got several of these pictures. You know, the guy sent me a lot of pictures. I tried to use a bunch of them. Um, well, they're moving, man. I didn't care how the roof looked. Right, right. Did it fix the, the leak and whatever the problem was? Probably. I, I don't have to justify it. I don't have to judge it. I don't have to qualify it. I'm supposed to list if I see repairs. There you go. Is that a repair? You think? Kind of sort of. Kind of sort of. And not to mention, <laughs> yeah, I can see replacing uh, tabs of, of shingles there because the rest of that roof looked pretty good. I don't really need to, to replace all of that. So. <laughs> but you definitely want to show that picture to your client, let them know there was a repair. Yeah, right. You know, the people living there may not have an issue with that. But to people buying it, once they see it, then it all of a sudden it's a big issue. Yeah, it's a huge issue. Yeah. I wish you had told me. Previous repairs may include roof covering materials or flashing details. I can't, you can't see the picture on the right. I should have lightened it up. Plus, that's a drone picture. So you have to lighten them up sometimes. But, you know, when you see, a, you see the mass all around, but, uh, that you know it's just all you can do is shake your head our probably our worst enemy is that idiot that cuts a boat in half and glues it back together this will solve any problem leaks previous repairs may include roof covering materials flashing details and roof penetrations everybody recognize the one on the left we should we should. That's another one of those. Do you list every all the roof penetrations? Do you make some sort of notation about the the satellite dishes on the roof? Do you, Paul? I absolutely do. Me too. Me too. I don't remember. I might have been Clay in that in that eight hour class that had the picture of this is what it's supposed to look like, and I had never to this day never seen that neat little box that's actual flashing that you know that these are supposed to sit on top of i've never seen one but i always put that in my report this is what it should look like so and of course we never see unworkmanlike repairs farmer brown got up on that roof with that neat spray exposed nails If, it, if you can see it, it's wrong. 
We see lots and lots of nails, I know. Well, it was lifting. <laughs> You're right, you solved that problem. It's not lifting anymore. Withdrawn nails, or the shingle lifted and popped through, and now that you can see the nail underneath, but there's a nice big hole there. Deficiencies in adhesion. This is a pretty interesting topic. Fasteners alone don't keep the shingles from flying off. A combination of fasteners and adhesive act together to hold a roof cover tight. We'll get Jim talking about the wind zones down there and how important this stuff is. Those of us that don't live in that zone one, you know, we, we may be a little flippant about this, but it's a whole different world down there along the coast. Um, I like this picture because it, it, it's so obvious where you had two different colored shingles. Obviously, in my mind, well, that was a repair, but huh, the new ones didn't seem to latch on to the old ones, did they? Sometimes the picture says it all. This one is the good old boy syndrome. And I, I can't help but ch chuckle. Uh, you know, I'm a 65 year old man. I can't tell you how many times I either helped or I was actually involved in putting on a roof a million years ago. And that, I mean, that's just how we did it. We put that starter strip of just a regular set of tabs, and, I mean, shingles, and you cut the tabs off. But they don't seal, do they? Film strips on the back of each shingle or prevent sticking together the shingles while they're bundled. Their removal is not required during application. It seems to me like there is a situation where they, you, you are supposed to remove them, but I don't remember what it is. Can you, can you think of a time where you are supposed to remove that? Uh, nobody's going to take time to do that. Yeah. Well, I know they don't. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, if, if if we we have it's pretty common to see shingles that have started lifting, um, and you know that old that old story of well, if they get hot enough, they'll lay back down. Well, uh, that, it can be fixed. You know, there is a correct way to do it, um, but it still needs to be pointed out. Observe and report. Deficiencies in roof cover materials. What can cause damage to the roof cover? Workmanship, wind, windborne debris, hail, abrasion, squirrels. I love that one because we see that a lot down here. Walking on the roof, satellite installation, <laughs> homeowners. <laughs> uh, but do we have to explain why or how a deficiency took place? The answer is no. That's the discussion you have with the client while they're there, but that doesn't go on the report or doesn't have to, I should say. There you go. Reckon the uh, shingle manufacturer intended for his shingles to look like that? I doubt it. And yeah, not to mention the load that they put on that roof doing that. Oh man, yeah, that's a whole nother story, isn't it? That's a lot of weight right there. Hey, here's the question. I don't want to well, don't want to skip this. And it says, does the lack of kickout flashing is that an issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I, I'm assuming I'm not a, the only person that calls that out. Mm -hmm. I've got a picture here showing what happened when the exterior was removed and there wasn't kickout flashing. Yeah, yeah, I write kickout flashing all the time. Yeah, all the time. Most manufacturers, you know, a lot of a lot of builders used to tell us that only uh, installed on stucco. Well, that's not the case. No, it is and not. Forty and LP require kickout flashing. You know, with the wall comes down and the, the uh, roof continues like that, so yeah. it requires a kickout. So yes, yeah. right it up. Yeah, absolutely. There's one of those uh, that we had the question earlier, where you can see those ripples. All the time. Yep. 
Yeah. Now this one's got such a neat pattern. Like you, you had mentioned, sometimes if it's the decking, you can kind of tell it's decking. To me, it seems like this more of a decking issue than the wrinkled underlayment, but. Yeah, it's got a pretty defined pattern on it. Pretty defined. But again, a discussion with the client where we can talk about all that, but then go in the report. This is just what I saw. But as soon as it gets hot enough, Don, it'll lay down. Yeah, it'll lay down. Yeah, you got a year to let that lay down. Call me at 10 months and I'll come around and do it again for you. <laughs> Granule loss. Now, you know, I, I like this. This I actually stole this from Clay's, Clay's part of his class. Due to manufacturing anomaly, can exhibit a distinct pattern. Uh, again, thank goodness, we don't have to explain why, right? We just say we observe shingles with granular loss. That's right. Don, no, we got about five more minutes, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's pick up, just spend a few minutes. Here's a picture of delamination. Hmm. Don't see that very often. It's kind of tricky to find, but that, that, um, Fiberglass edge kind of gives it away. Some more granular loss. I've got some discussion where I talk about the overhang. There's some blistering. Roof penetrations. Here we go. Installation shingles overhang. Varies among manufacturers, but generally between three eighths and three fours. I have this weird little in my mind. I put <laughs> I put my thumb next to my first finger at the first digit. And if if my finger goes all the way up underneath those, I write it up. I know that sounds silly, but you know. That's funny, Don. Never weird. Never I was my younger days when putting on roofs, we would always bend our, our finger, the uh, one next to the thumb. Yep. And when up that first joint, that was enough. Yep. That's what I'm talking about, exactly. Yep. Old school, brother. Yeah, what's that say about us? <laughs> <laughs> move, move on along, Don. Okay. Here's, you know, here's where it... it now, when you do something like that with all that gutter full of granulars, Yeah. I write it up, the roof has granular loss. Me too. Those granulars are the life of the shingles, in my opinion. Me too. And sometimes you can't necessarily realize how much loss there is, you know, especially on a, a roof that's not very old. Yeah, we don't know how much is washed out of that gutter already. Yeah, yeah. So that I definitely shoot that, put that in there. I'm going kind of quick here, but these are pretty common stuff that we see all the time. We still get questions. Here's some more information about hail. I, you know, this is a really neat stuff, and I was, I was concerned that we wouldn't have time to cover all of this. Here's a picture of hail damage. I reckon that's Layton. <laughs> I still, I, I'll call this out in a heartbeat. <laughs> At some point, you're like, uh, yeah, you, we have a problem here. And this is talking about how how different hail can be from the windward side and the leeward side. It, it, it can be a huge difference. Um, how the hail affects the way it hits, and depending on wind and direction and all of that, can even change the way the hail damage looks. Wow. Yeah, that's something in it. What, what we see as inspectors. There's a lot, like I said, this is an eight hour class and we're really covering what we needed to make sure that we're doing with our SOPs. What we can do, what we don't have to do, what we have to do, and all of that needs to become part of your process. And you just wanna make sure that you're thinking through all of this concept when you're putting your inspection together and when you're putting your report together. So, 
wish we could go through a lot more pictures. I still have quite a few stuff here, but I, you know, on the class where there's not a lot of discussion, I didn't know what kind of time we would have. Um, are there any more cool questions we want to try to answer real quick, or are we out of time? No, I think uh, no more questions over right now, but uh, Don, I want to thank you for a great class, man. Good information, and uh, I appreciate you sharing your experience and knowledge with, with the attendees of the class. I want to thank all of you for attending the class and uh, hope that you have a, a fine rest of your weekend. Uh, if you'd like to put a comment in the chat box, tell us how Don did or any thoughts, what we can do to improve it, please add them now. I'll give you a few minutes to do that before we close the class out. But Don, thanks again for it. Great class and appreciate all the comments, quick Q and A's and uh, everything else. So you guys take care. Don, thanks again for sharing and uh, We'll talk at you later. Thanks, guys. Good to good to have time to spend with you. Everybody stay safe. All right, Don. You too. Take care.